I'm Jamie Woodruff. I'm a certified penetration testing engineer and a cyber essentials assessor as well. So today I'm going to be talking to you about social engineering, manipulation for information. So I normally talk for about 45 minutes to an hour, so I've had to shrink it down for the 30 minutes, but hopefully it's interesting. So I want to start this off, you know, with the evolution of hacking. So when I was growing up, we was almost the banks of the cyber world, you could say, right? So we'd do digital graffiti, we'd pack websites, we'd leave our little mark and we'd move on, you know? And part of that, we'd even write a little document in their website folder saying, this is how we did it, you know, this is how you can fix it. So it was kind and nice in a certain way. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't about stealing information. It wasn't about extorting information. You know, it wasn't about making money at all. It was the fact that we could do it, and that's what we did. And it kind of evolved towards, you know, the, the group side of things. So if we look now, we see Anonymous everywhere, you know, hacking these websites. And we see Anonymous as a collective, a large organization of, of super cool hackers. That's what we perceive it. But in theory, there's only about 10 to 15 hackers we in Anonymous per se that do and co conduct these attacks or hacks. And it's completely evolved from, you know, the fact that it was single individuals to move on to the smaller groups. But as you see in moving on in the presentation, we'll see large you know, corporate extortion of what's occurring around the world. And it's a massive multi-billion pound industry. It's hacking. So the perception of a hacker. Now, when I meet someone in an airport, I'm talking to someone and they say what you do. Half the time now, I just say I work in insurance. I really can't be bothered justifying what ethical hacking is, especially, <laughs> especially when they don't understand you know, what hacking is. And you talk to someone and like, oh, where's my phone? I'm hiding it. You're running away. And you're like, dude, you know? I'm certified in what I do. Trust me, it was hard work to get it. Um, and we perceive you know, individuals as being sat there with hoodies on, okay, or the anonymous mask, and the guys you know, in the mum's basement. But I was in my mum's attic. It's completely different. <laughs> and you know, the, the perception side, we need to be aware and understand that it could be any one of you guys in the audience. right? It, it could be anybody. It doesn't have to be that image of that guy that sat there with the hoodie. And the media kind of portrays that. So you just need to be aware from your side. Now, organized business cybercrime. So this is, again, a massive multi-billion pound industry around the world. Now, this occurs all the time. So what, what I've kind of found doing my, uh, my research is there's entire office blocks you know, around the world, certain types of companies that are set up just to hack third party individuals. That's all they do. They have KPIs. They have targets that they meet. They get paid a salary. They pay tax, believe it or not. And you know, they just hack rival companies and sell that data because you know, if one thing you can take away is data is more valuable than currency. You know, and as during the presentation, we'll talk about data laundering as well. So once you've stole that data, it takes five minutes to steal 300,000 accounts. Just five minutes. It's not even a lot of work or effort. So it's, it's the organized business cybercrime as well that we need to be aware of. Now, let's talk about good old fashioned ransomware and how it's evolved. So the first ever ransomware came out, I think it was 1989. And the first one was AIDS. So someone sent a floppy disk, which was before my time. And on the floppy disk, it was infected with ransomware. Okay? And this individual, this doctor, put that into his machine, and his files got zipped up, just like we see it today. Now, what was funny is how we've evolved from $189 to Panama in the post to you know, Bitcoin and virtual currencies and how they're paying. But I mean, ransomware can be solved a lot of the time by you know, keeping yourself up to date, keeping your machine up to date and your patches applied. But if we look at the re recent you know, NHS uh, attacks that occurred, that was a simple you know, SMB port that was enabled that should have been disabled that allowed it to spread so much. So the ransomware side of things has completely evolved now to where we see you know, they even provide a live messaging chat system when you get infected with ransomware, which is stupid. So you can talk to someone at the other side of the world that will teach you how to get your files back. They don't give you a discount, but they'll teach you how to get your files back. And you know, certain types of ransomware now even provide a free phone number, live support that you could call, that will teach you how to buy Bitcoin, that will teach you how to recover your files. So for £10,000, you can buy your own ransomware. You don't need to understand it or have any knowledge of how it works. You get an account manager, okay, a hacker on the other end that's developed it. And every day, you can text that individual and say how many people have been infected. It's becoming that readily available now. So moving on to my speciality, this is what I really enjoy. So what is social engineering? It's the art of manipulation for information. It's a cyber attack that relies on minimal technological intervention. So who's heard of social engineering here? Put your hands up. Wow, that's really good. I was doing a talk in Dubai yesterday, so excuse the jet lag, but four people put their hands up in 1,000 people. I was like, geez, you know? 
also known as bugs in the human hardware. So it's my job to break into companies legally and ethically by any means necessary without causing physical damage or distress. That's normally my perimeters. So I broke into airports around the world. I broke into a financial institu institution dressed up as a pizza boy, <laughs> which was funny. We'll talk about that later on. Um, but you know, it's, it's just the main easiest way that I can do to, to break into companies or to break into infrastructure. I mean, now I won't even try and hack it remotely. There's no point. I'm either going to get detected or I'm not going to get in. I'll just turn up on the door and just walk straight in and just be somebody else and then extract the data legally and ethically. Two important words there. Okay, you need to just remember them words, okay? And, you know, this is a really funny one. So I'm called Joseph, okay? Nice to meet you guys. And I was talking at an event, and there was, there was about 2,000 people. And the organizers said, Jamie, we want you to freak them out and do something, okay? So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll pick my brain and, and come up with something. So I spoke to one of the senior executives at the hotel chain, Luton Who, and I said, like, I'm not being funny, but I want to be, you know, a staff member for the day. And he's like, why? And I'm like, this is the reason why. He's like, okay, no worries. There's a uniform. Thanks. No worries. And on that day, I served everybody tea and biscuits. I followed everybody at the conference. I listened to their conversations. I watched them type their phone pins in. I knew loads of information about the individuals. And when you guys have a drink at night, it's amazing. You tell so many stories and secrets about your companies. It's unreal. And... <laughs> You know, towards the end of the day, um, so, and you're really horrible to delegate and conference staff, sorry, by the way, as well, especially at conferences. I was getting abuse all day. Um, I think, in fact, believe it or not, um, I actually got a disciplinary for wearing trainers by a management, which I thought was really funny because I'm not employed, but I got in trouble for wearing trainers. <laughs> And <laughs> seriously, I got a fool in trouble. So anyway, um, so I was, went to stand on stage towards the end of the day. And the conference staff, the, there's just one person from the staff that knew who I was and the reason why I was here today. And they're like, get off the stage, get off the stage. And I'm carrying cutlery and stuff, wandering around the stage. And they're, they're waiting for Jamie to come on stage to speak. And I put him down. I said, well, I'm Jamie Woodrow. And everybody's faces just drop. You know, like, I've been horrible to him today and all sorts. And I'm like, yeah. So I used them as my entire presentation about what I'd learned you know, in that short space of time. And there was so much information that I could have extracted. You know, People using laptops at conferences, just leaving them there and going and getting a coffee and then coming back. And what do we do as, as humans? We slowly shut the lid, but we don't close it fully and we don't log out. We just leave it like half shut. No one's going to touch it. It's ridiculous. And another one, you know, uniforms are key. So all these are easily obtainable on eBay. You know, I think the Royal Mail outfit cost me about £40 from some ex-disgruntled employee. He cut the cereal out, I noticed, of the jacket, so you couldn't tell which employee it was. Um, and, you know, for this one, I used all the time to break into companies. So there was a company in London that I was doing some work for, and they have uh, offices in Boston and offices all the way around the world. And their, 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 um, their managing director turned around and said, Jamie, you can't break into our company. You know, we're on 7-4. You have to get through reception. There's no way for you to do it. And I said, OK, I'll give it a challenge. So you know, I turned up as FedEx because after a few days of watching them, I noticed this FedEx guy would go in and deliver a package and go and pick one up and go out. So I turned up as FedEx, and there's this you know, young guy that sat on reception. I'm like, hey, I'm here for this company. And he said, well, and? And I was like, what do you mean, and? I'm here to deliver a package, to pick one up, and then I'll be on my way. He's like, oh, well, you know, and all this stuff. And I said, you spoke to me last week. We had the same conversation last week, right? You're just delaying my day. I really want to go. I cannot be bothered with this. OK, no problem. There's a visitor badge. OK, awesome. Well, on the same day, I actually had my agent with me and a business colleague of mine. And I badged them in with my pass so they could come around with me. And I got into the lift. And um, a certain friend of mine from a certain uh, security organization in the UK was in the lift. So he's looking at me thinking, Jamie, you're dressed as FedEx. What are you doing? Are you here to see us today? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm on the seventh floor. And he's like, this, this building should have been really secure. And he was panicking the fact that I got into the lift, got to the seventh floor, and they had you know, the NFC doors that you tag into and tag out to. They were just wide open with the blinker, just blinking, waiting for someone to patch the badge in. So then I walked around the entire infrastructure, took pictures of exactly what I did, and then built a report and gave it to the MD and said, look, you know, I was sat in your canteen eating a jacket potato with your employees, <laughs> <laughs> dressed as FedEx, while I had my agent and my MD of the company as well, and we're sat here in your infrastructure that you said secure. There's always a weakness and always a way in. So I helped him mitigate that risk, and now no visitor is, uh, on it. they're all escorted around you know, by a member of security or a member of staff. But that tiny little issue could have led to, you know, a massive compromise. This is the most clothed picture I could find of Kim. I'm terribly sorry. Um, 
So I'm known for you know, finding exploits in Facebook. Um, I'm known for hacking Kim Kardashian as well, uh, legally and ethically, OK? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, with Kim, um, I remember Kanye West got a, an honorary PhD from a university. And I was really upset, OK? So I was like, I'm going to find a post on his blog, and I'm going to tweet about it. So I was going through her blog to see the post, and I couldn't find it. But I noticed it was spitting some SQL queries out onto the page. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to be there. So I built a proof of concept of how I could have injected into that point to extract you know, the information out. And it turns out there was 52 million accounts that could have been compromised through all the social media feeds, everything. You know? And I built this proof of concept. I reached out to Kim's team, and I said, look, you know, this is what I found. You know, I've not used any automated testing tools. I've not tested the exploit, but I'm pretty sure this will work. So they come back to me and they said, no, 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 it's a load of rubbish. So I said, well, in the best interest of the public, I'm going public in 30 days. You know, if you come back to me and say, we're not going to fix it for a year, then I have to keep quiet. You know, I can't just go public. So uh, in 30 days, I went public. And six days later, she had a brand new website, a brand new app that was launched and everything. So she turned it into a bit of a PR stunt. But you know, the way that I look at it, I saved 52 million uh, accounts from getting compromised. And with Facebook, back in the early days, I think I was 15 when I found quite a few vulnerabilities. And I found some over the years as well. But these were simple human errors that I was able to exploit, OK, under the Responsible Disclosure Scheme, ethical and legal. And you know, I got awarded some money from Facebook and numerous different things. But the reason why I want to mention this is for responsible disclosure. You guys should definitely implement it in your infrastructure. You should encourage white hat hackers like me, white hat, not gray or black or red, white, and um, encourage people like me to attack your infrastructure legally by certain perimeters that you define. Now, you know, that would save your reputation damage. It'll save your financial loss. But also, they're getting hoodies and free swag off you, so they'll enjoy it. So, you know? Now, routine. How flawed is that routine? So what time do you guys wake up? Shout out. Five? Who said five? <laughs> Dude, that sucks, man. I don't think I've seen. <laughs> I haven't seen 5 AM for a long while. Uh, so I have these working hours you know, that we do. I do 10 till 4. They're my hours. I beat traffic. <laughs> so, so you wake up at 5, OK? So I'll use you as an example. What do you do when you wake up at 5? Do you go downstairs? Do you have kids? Yeah, I've got a little boy. A little boy? How old is he? Uh, one. Yeah, what's your mother's maiden name? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So you have a little boy, OK, that's one. And presumably, he doesn't go to school yet because he's one, OK? You know, he's not on solid foods yet as well. So. <laughs> and you know, you say, do you have a wife or a girlfriend? Yeah, partly. Yeah, yeah partly. No, 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 partner. No, oh, partner. I thought you said partly. I was like, well, <laughs> is this like a certain day of the week or? Um, so partly. And you know, what you probably do is have breakfast with them. You know, have have a chat with them before you go to work or or whatever. Yeah, okay. Dad, do you drive the same route to work? Uh, Unless it's road works, obviously. It yeah. Yeah? Work, yeah. Yeah. And you arrive at roughly the same time. Uh, do you talk to the same people? A bit of a sales rep over there. I got that in. Um, yeah, and you know you have your breaks at roughly the same time. You know you hang out at the same places and you drive back the same route. Don't be awkward. No. <laughs> Represent the population. You know, so so not 75, 80 percent of us would do that. You know, we'd have the same regular routine. So after me watching you for three, four, five days, I pretty much know where you're going to be. You know, how many people have posted on social media that they're here? Put their hands up. So you guys have not posted on LinkedIn. You've not put on Twitter or Facebook. I'm afraid of you. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we publish and post it all the time, right? And it's the routine that lets us down. We're not observant of our surroundings. We don't look around us. We're just in you know, autopilot mode. We do the same thing repetitively. So I'm really surprised hackers haven't targeted conferences, because you give out free stuff all the time. Free USBs, free chargers, you know, little robots today that will walk in. And you know, I'm surprised that they've not infected them devices, because there's hundreds of companies that could potentially be here or get infected. So again, we need to be understanding you know, our bar routine. We need to be aware of our surroundings. <coughs> Safest method of communication is a carrier pigeon. Okay? I'm sure some vendors will disagree with their software, but trust me. Unless you're Luke and you're a really good shot, but trust me, it's a it's the safest method. Because you know, if we send information, it goes through servers, it goes through hops, it goes through many different outlays. There's a potential for that data to get intercepted, you know, along them lines. So I just put this in for a bit of fun. Feel free to laugh. And uh, so now I'm going to talk about sorry. How safe is fax? How safe is fax? Who uses fax? That's like saying, hey, can I sell you some scuzzy? <laughs> 
questions at the end. <laughs> okay, Bill. <laughs> so this got me in a bit of trouble, actually, recently. So this is, well, I don't want to say my doll, Kayla, but it's a doll that I got given to me. Oh, that sounds really bad. <laughs> and this doll, you know, is vulnerable. It can be compromised. You can listen into conversations inside your house. You know, certain IoT devices, you can take pictures through, um, through the cameras in these toys. And, well, apparently, so I was flying to Brussels last week, and I got detained in the airport under the espionage act. <laughs> it's banned to import that now. So just for FYI, if you're carrying dolls, be aware of that. And, you know, the IoT device, so I've actually got this robot with me today, and I'll do a demonstration towards the end, but it does the same thing, right? So this, this toy can be compromised. You can make it say things that it wouldn't normally say. You can make it listen to keywords that, you know, anything that could be triggered. And we buy these for our kids all the time. You know, a lot of IoT is not regulated in a way that it should be. We had, a, um, at one point, Foscam. So who's heard of Foscam? Baby monitors. You know, it's a big one. It's still occurring. So I think it was 900,000 devices that could potentially be compromised. Now, with Foscam, they had the default username and password for every single um, baby monitor. So hackers built a script to crawl through Google and the internet and found all these Foscam devices using Shodan and other methods. They'd then compromise the device and take pictures of the baby sleeping. They'd then ring up the parents through social media and say, look, you know, give me some money. And because it was newborns, they weren't coming forward straight away to the police until at least six months. A lot of people got affected by IoT. So it's just a quick mention. So who wants to be my guinea pig? Put your hands up. And don't be boring. <laughs> Someone want to? One. Well done. I'll give you some sweets after. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. I don't like silence, please. <laughs> I need another guinea pig. Does someone want a guinea pig, man? This is not illegal. It's ethical and legal, with permission <laughs> and consent. Follow me, actually. Do you want to volunteer? <coughs> Anyone want to volunteer? Come on then, come to the front. Get a bit of sales time in for you. Talk amongst yourselves, please. We don't like silence. I don't, good lad. <laughs> you're learning, Elliot, you're learning. Elliot, give me your number, dude. Uh, 07. Do you want to shout it louder? There's some single people. <laughs> <laughs> Five, one. Yep. 4945. 4945. Can you say combine? Combine. Nice. <laughs> What's your number, dude? 077. Yep. 29. Yep. Five. That was fast. Are you a programmer by any chance? Uh, partially, but not for a while. Partially? How can you partially program? Well, okay, I can't, but I can't do it. <laughs> Does it not. work? <laughs> Does it not? Is that like a, bi <laughs> is that a binary joke? <laughs> program is a way of putting bugs into the program, isn't it? Because bugs is a way of taking them back out. Okay. That was technical terms. Well done. That was good. Sorry, I'm really jet lagged. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Do you want to whip your phones out? You can become friends. So, what number is that? Do you want to read it out? 8284. Yeah. Is that you? Do you want to answer it? Hello. You like programming, dude? Are you good? Yeah? You can hear me? Yeah. Okay, you can sit down. Cheers. <laughs> I'll take your business cards at the end as well. So the reason why I wanted to demonstrate that is that is a free app on the App Store. Right? Nothing trickery at all. Just a free app on the App Store. Now, I can call you from your office number right now, and it'd show the office calling you, right? How many people here would question that, the authenticity in a large company or a large scale of seeing that number? Not many people. Now, there's certain bugs in uh, certain carriers where I can call you from your own number, and it'll say, welcome to your voicemail by using this free app. How many people here have voicemail pins? Put your hands up. Quite a few. That's good. To those who don't, I recommend you get one and don't put 1337 or 1234. And you know, this, this free app, you know, it's easily accessible. But for, if you call an infrastructure from their other internal number, so they have a remote office, it'll show us an internal call getting routed. Now, if you guys post that you're here you know, on social media or on LinkedIn, me as a white hat hacker, you know, I could see that data. But from an ethical perspective, they could also see that data, but then compromise your infrastructure by making a phone call saying you requested some information or data. Sometimes I'll book myself in for meetings with an individual by calling from an internal phone number. So it makes it look like that I'm supposed to be coming into that infrastructure. Okay? Now, obviously, I have consent from companies to do this. I don't just willy-nilly you know, make phone calls. I don't just text my boss and, from uh, HR saying I can have time off. Yeah? 
It doesn't work like that. Okay? But again, free app on the App Store. So just be aware, you know? Another one, I'm going to teach you how to get any item under $10,000 in five minutes for free, for research and education purposes only. <laughs> so don't be going back to the vendor and getting serial numbers afterwards, all right? So someone shout out items. Don't say elephant, electrical items. I had someone shout out an elephant, so. Go on, iPad. Who said that? Put your hand up. Very, iPad. OK, so there's two methods to do this, right? So method number one, um, Apple cottoned on and patched it. But method number two is genius, how they got around it. So number one, they go to PC World with a hacker and they'd look on display for models, like I say, an iPad, OK? On the back of the iPad, you'll have the serial number, OK? It sounds, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know. And they'll go home with that serial number and they'll call Apple Direct. And they'll be like, hey, welcome to Apple. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Yeah. Is it plugged in at the wall? Yeah. Um, all the, you know, the, the simple troubleshooting steps that they do. Um, and then eventually, you know, the, you'll go through it and you go through a checklist and they'll say, can you return it to a store that you purchased it to get covered on the warranty? And the hacker will turn around and make up an excuse, one of them being, oh, my grandfather's passed away. He bought it for my birthday. I, I don't know which store it was. Sorry. OK, no worries. It's covered under the manufacturer's warranty anyway. Um, what's it called? Can I have a copy of your card or a credit card or debit card to keep on file? If you don't return the item within 30 days, then we're going to charge that card in full. So the hacker will go to Asda or Walmart, if you guys go Walmart or whatever. Or we don't have Walmart here. Asda or uh, Waitrose. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so on the, uh, you know, on the wall, you can get a Visa debit card, right? So for £10 balance that you can pretty much use anywhere. So they'll buy this card that's not registered to anyone. And the, the, uh, Apple will take a pound off it to verify the card's legit. They'll store the card on file. And then you know, they'll give you an advanced replacement that'll arrive the day after. So a hacker will look around his neighborhood and find um, to let properties or vacant properties and put a note on the door saying, please leave package at the nearest shop or store or neighbors or whatever. So then that address will get blacklisted, but it's not the hacker's address. Or they'll sell it direct on eBay to an individual and then sell it as a, you know, a refurbished product. And then when it comes from Apple, it doesn't look like it's been uh, exploited. But then Apple turned around and was like, no, you know, we're not doing that anymore. We want to see the item in our warehouse. We want to make sure we're not, we're not getting scammed. So what did the hacker do? He went and bought an empty box off eBay. They're going all the time. Four or five pounds for the empty box, two pounds, whatever. He went to the local plumbing store and he buys some dry ice. He weighs the dry ice exactly like the product inside the box. He wraps that up and takes it to Royal Mail or the courier service. They weigh it. It weighs exactly the same as what the product would be. By the time it reaches to, where that, to the warehouse, it's turned into carbon dioxide. It shows that Royal Mail have stole the item out of the box because the weight was the same. <laughs> yeah? And then Apple had advanced replacement. There's always a way around it. Sony Bravio TV has the same serial number for every single 50-inch TV they made. Again, this product here is what was created by a group known as Astropid. And you can basically get free Pringles. You can get free <laughs> anything. Amazon products all sorts have the serial numbers built in. And they've used their algorithm to generate new product serials. So again, hackers are making thousands upon thousands of pounds by using this. So if you have a serialized product or warranty that you use for a cereal, just be aware of that. Pineapple. Who's here heard of a pineapple? Yeah. A few people. Do you mind getting me a glass of water, Christian? Cheers. Um, so a pineapple, OK? So for those who don't know, you can intercept communication, sorry, intercept connections around you from devices. So if you have a phone in here or a, an iPad or a laptop, if you turn on the pineapple and set it up to receive karma packets with the use internally, your devices one by one in the audience will start connecting to this pineapple. Now, if you're connected to an access point currently or connected to the hotel, they can create a denial of service attack against that AP to force you to disconnect and then connect to the strongest signal, which could potentially be the pineapple. Now, you can buy this online for 110 pounds. You know, you can only get it from Ireland, ironically, but you can buy it online. And you know, with this device, it can create a man in the middle based attack. Now, the way that it works is from the moment that your phone was manufactured to Wi-Fi networks that you've connected to get stored on the device for easy comfort. When we go home, it connects. When we go to the office, it connects conferences, vice versa. Now, every free public Wi-Fi that you've used also gets you know, stored on the device. So this just tricks your phone that's looking for them known networks by saying, yes, I'm McDonald's. You know? Yes, I'm the hotel. Yes, I'm your house. And each one by one, your devices will start connecting. And then from there, you can potentially intercept data, um, on certain older devices um, that have not had the patches applied, you can potentially watch people through the webcam. You know, there was an exploit with Mac on uh, the old operating system where you can disable the light as well. So you can see someone through the webcam, but the light wouldn't appear on it. So just be very wary of connecting to public Wi-Fi. Make sure you use a VPN. People preach it all the time. It's really important. Trust me. I'm always on a VPN. Always. Except here today. 
but <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> So this is what I like to use as an example. Um, this is not in any way disrespecting Windows, OK? I'm just putting it as an example. And you know, this is your infrastructure. You spend millions and millions of pounds on your infrastructure, but your employees are the hedges, OK? So we don't focus around them with training. We don't train them efficiently about you know, social engineering or about what could occur. Sorry. <laughs> and you know, for this, uh, this example, it's always important to focus around the training element. Employees are the weakest link. I cannot stress that, OK, inside your infrastructure. They are the easiest. For instance, imagine you're going through supermarket, and you get to the checkout, right? And the lady or the guy that's on the till, and they've got no carrier bags, they say, they, sorry, they never have any carrier bags. They hit their job subliminally. They didn't say we. They said they. That tiny word distinguishes between their behavioral differences. Someone that said, oh, sorry, we never have any carrier bags. They're probably a new employee. They might be in senior management. They treat it as a family oriented workplace. So that two tiny thing could lead to an exploit. But again, it's the employee that's the weakest link. And I'm Jamie Woodruff, the Cyber Safety Advisor for the Cyber Smile Foundation. I'm also the Technical Director for Metrics Cloud Limited. I'm the advisor for Accenture. And that's my personal Twitter and our company Twitter. Now, I'm going to do some live demonstrations, but feel free to clap. <laughs> So I thought I'd show you a really interesting thing that I found quite recently. So just by using Google, so we're going to Google, OK? So once we've connected to Google, you can search for key strings. So we all know that you know, in URL, uh, view.shtml, if I can spell, um, that would then open access public cameras, CCTV cameras that you can then connect to. You can then you know, focus the camera on an infrastructure. Now, the joys of using this with Google Chrome is it geolocates to around your location. So it finds businesses or access devices around your location that you can actually see. Now, I am not breaking any laws. It's legal and ethical because you know, I'm not logging in with any credentials. These are open, and they're on the public domain. I'm just using Google to search for these. Now, the scariest one that we just found recently you know, is if I copy this into here, it shows data centers that you can connect to and manipulate temperatures. You can do all sorts. Look at alerts, see the maps, see the graphs internally. You know, you can even see, if we go to maps, if we see there, some of the data. Um, you can turn off these devices. You can turn off the APC as well. You can do all sorts of dangerous stuff without logging in with credentials, right? Now, that's just one. There's another one here. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So you can use Google to search for these dorks. You can find confidential documents online, all sorts of information, because Google's constantly gathering. So just be aware, because your infrastructure might potentially have been leaked online, or might have been indexed via Google. So the best thing to use is a website called Shodan, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'll show you anyway. So Shodan's like a hacking search engine for unethical hackers, but it's also good for companies to find if their infrastructure has been indexed or been put online. So if we look in here and we just type thermostat, as an example, you can defrost someone's fridge, but we're not going to do that <laughs> because that's unethical. <laughs> do you see? So you can search for baby monitors. You can search for SSL certificates that might have expired on your infrastructure. You can search for your company names, and you could potentially find host names associated with your business. So look at Shonan. See if any of your infrastructure has been indexed online. Um, so yeah, that concludes my talk. I think I've been told to shut up now. So thank you very much, guys. I hope you have a good day. Thank you.